by which I don't mean to dis disparage pop cultural discourse or academic cultural history, but I wish to suggest how relatively difficult it is for them to register what Shelley calls the wild spirit of terror. In the academy, there's a tremendous pressure to contain terror within the objective parameters of history, sociology, political economy, military strategy, and so on. Our discursive resources can seem impotent <clears throat> to evoke the actual subjective experience of terror that we know, but only on an abstract level, to be as terrifying as ever. The problem in the terms of Shelley's defense of poetry is our failure to imagine what we know. A poem, Shelley says in one of the defense's famously elusive phrases, is the very image of life expressed in its internal truth. By way of explaining what makes poetry's image of life eternal, Shelley contrasts it with the image offered by narrative. Quote, there is this difference between a story and a poem, that a story is a catalog of detached facts which have no other bond of connection than time, place, circumstance, cause, and effect. Poetry, by contrast, is universal, which Shelley crucially gives a functional definition. Poetry is distinguished from narrative not by any determinate positive attribute. Instead, poetry is just what endures time, which for Shelley no less than Hegel means enduring negation, or as Hegel puts it, tearing with the negative. Poetry is nothing other than that which survives the deterioration of narratively sustained meanings and values. Shelley's sonnet, Ozymandias, for example, figures poetry as a ruined sculpture that continues to display the artist's insight into a tyrant's sneer of cold command long after the kingdom itself has been reduced to dust. So Shelley writes in the defense that, quote, time destroys uh, the use of the story that augments that of poetry. What makes poetry poetry is distilled, thrown into ever finer relief by destruction. In other words, in exactly the terms of the Ode to the West Wind, poetry makes destruction productive. If, Shelley continues, the story of particular facts is as a mirror that obscures and distorts, then poetry is a mirror which makes be beautiful what is distorted. Poetry per se is poetry of what history and narrative leave distorted and destroyed. To take a convenient example, if in Thomas Hardy's Darkling Thrush of uh, 1900, the image of a broken lyre serves to evoke an apocal eclipse or the devastation of poetry as such, then Hardy's uh, 1914 lyric on the sinking of the Titanic mobilizes renewed poetics of devastation and darkness themselves, making the sunken wreck a liar unto itself. Quote, steel chambers, late the pyres of her salamandrine fires, cold currents thrid, and turn to rhythmic tidal liars. My contrast between the later and earlier Hardy, between Shelley and Wordsworth, and between the readership of the Romantic period and that of our own, are all examples of a crucial dimension of modern leftist, leftist politics, which is played out uh, in contention between radical and bourgeois versions of liberalism's key terms. Literature has been a key front in this struggle, in which ever again, Bourgeois conceptions of utopia are pitted against radical conceptions of utopia. Bourgeois subjectivity against radical subjectivity. Bourgeois community against radical community, and so on. In this struggle, a crucial but underappreciated tendency of radicalism has been to defend the more, not less, rigid and formalistic versions of these values. Such defense is rooted in one of the pillars of modern leftism going back to Rousseau's notorious contention that freedom can be forced. The critique of hypocrisy, a basically enlightenment devotion to formal rigor and consistency expressed in the critical method associated with Kant, concerned not with generalizing from particular determinate experiences, but rather with deducing the conditions of possibility of any experience 
experience whatsoever. Rousseau and Kant recognize something later liberals have been prone to neglect, which is that democratic free agency is not infinitely accommodating, but on the contrary, a very specific social norm entailing specific rules and conditions of possibility. What it means to be a person, an autonomous agent, in the context of modern capitalist democracy is an idiosyncratic cultural project, an attempt to fulfill a specific set of cultural ideals by a limited variety of means, which is to say that this project can go wrong. Our attempts to fulfill its terms can fail in any variety of ways. This is not news to readers of modern literature, which since Hamlet has been generating a teeming library of hypothetical case studies exploring how, why, and what it feels like for the attempt to be a person to fall short. For bourgeois culture, these cases provide vital occasions for exercising and demonstrating empathy, mobilizing the sympathetic imagination to dispel the waste, damage, and other unappetizing byproducts of the normative project of liberal subjectivity. Sentimentality is an all-purpose cleanser turning all variety of damage into occasions to reaffirm the same thing, the limitless bourgeois capacity for empathy. Thus, sentimentality has a basically neurotic structure in which, should, in, in which disruptions to the norm of liberal, liberal subjectivity become occasions not for reconfiguring such subjectivity, but for clinging all the more tightly to that norm. This neurotic structure is evident in the account that modern liberal capitalism following Adam Smith offers of its own history as one of emancipation. The rational self-interest of atomic Cartesian subjects becomes ever more unconstrained even as this is supposedly steered by the sympathetic imagination to the collective benefit of society at large. The otherwise inexplicable good luck that individual liberty should, both, should be so scrupulously self-correcting. Smith illustrates by staging what will, what will become an iconic test case of liberal subjectivity, the encounter with a stranger in an urban setting. Wordsworth offers his version of this test uh, in his prelude, encountering a blind beggar in a London street wearing a label to identify himself. For Wordsworth, this encounter is literally revolutionary. His sense of gravitational or even planetary orientation is upended as he feels himself admonished with the power of ocean tides from another world. By contrast, Smith celebrates the capacity of the bourgeois subject precisely imaginatively contain the suffering of the derelict he happens upon. According to Smith, Another suffering does not throw in question, but it consolidates one's sovereignty <clears throat> as a spectator. Sentimental binging on spectacles of suffering serves to reassure us that suffering is just a spectacle. Empathy, then, can be seen less as mitigating possessive self-interest than <coughs> fostering it. And modern liberal subjects can be seen less as mutually beneficent than, on the contrary, is caught in a neurotic spiral of ever-intensifying rivalry and resentment. If Smith's subject stages its own negation as a spectacle that covertly buttresses its claim to an unencumbered, sovereign perspective, then Hegel deconstructs Smith's conclusion just by recognizing such violently antagonistic individualism for what it is. In the tradition of Rousseau and Kant, Hegel's most basic appeal is for a kind of integrity of self-consciousness, taking responsibility for all of the ramifications of my experience, including those that expose the destructive or neurotic way uh, in which experience gets framed as mine in the first place. This is in keeping with the basic procedure of the phenomenology in general an unprecedented one in the history of philosophy, which looks more like the modern literary exploration of cases of failed agency mentioned above 
than traditional philosophical argumentation. The book proceeds by positing possible models for how experience might be organized, how basic criteria of truth and goodness and so on might be defined, and then in the manner of a novel, testing how these models fare under various hypothetical circumstances, which eventually reveal the models to fall short of their own normative claims, and thus to collapse and give way to ever new corrective models that are informed by the foregoing failures, that incorporate these failures into formally enriched, more nuanced and complex criteria of truth and goodness. So cultural history progresses for Hegel as a kind of novel. The phenomenology is commonly characterized as a Bildungsroman of the spirit, a kind of developmental or coming-of-age story of just the kind of historical consciousness that the book itself brings to fruition by grasping this development as one coherent story. But in the name of this talk is to question this view. Hegel's conception of historical development is, like Shelley's, radically skeptical of narratively secured conclusions. Instead, history progresses only in the weak or ironic sense of tarrying with the negative in ever more nuanced ways, of unlearning positivistic mistakes and learning to derive new resources from the wreckage resulting from such mistakes. Retooling wreckage represents a kind of progress, but not in the traditional developmental sense of achieving some uh, positive purpose. It's instead the progress entailed by disabusing oneself of an illusion, a progress toward no telos other than the negative Socratic wisdom of knowing that one knows nothing. If the phenomenology is a novel, then it's a decidedly modernistic one, like Proust's Swan in Love, which charts the manifold divigations of the protagonist's obsessive love for a woman who, he concedes, is not, was not really even my type. Narrative purpose is a pretext for non-narrative or poetic digression, like that which, to take another canonical example, the dying Hamlet leaves to Horatio and the audience to retell. Report my cause right to be unsatisfied, Hamlet says that his cause was just what Hamlet himself could never figure out. To warrant retelling, Hamlet has to have made his very unstory-worthiness story-worthy in some new way. And we, in turn, to do this new kind of story justice, can't merely tell it as if it were like any other story, but must do something more like emulate Hamlet's own mysteriously compelling failure. Hegel's key account of the urgency with which such failures can appeal to us is his dialectic of Lord and Bondsman. <clears throat> this can be reduced to four key contentions. One, the master and slave don't merely uh, describe the differential of power in a relationship. Uh, rather, they are two normative roles or social conventions that, as Hegel learned from Rousseau, we on some level voluntarily adopt, even if we may, might not consciously do so. As Rousseau says in his essay on inequality, if mastery were a matter of continuous, complete physical coercion and control, it just wouldn't be worth the effort. Two, Hegel shows that as a conventional role, mastery is totally frustrating, paralyzing enslavement to the empty, abstract pretense to have power, whatever that means. Mastery, like power, is a hollow badge, an empty suit, a fetish that entails the same kind of self-tyrannizing that William Blake acts out in his poem, The Tiger. Slavery, obviously, isn't great either, but it has the crucial advantage, Hegel says, of affording the freedom to work. The master can't express his power except by coercing his slaves, but they can only really be slaves by working to some extent independently. If the master deprives them of this by completely overpowering or killing them, then he deprives himself of any evidence of his mastery. Work offers slaves a relative autonomy to engage 
the means of their labor on their own terms, the actual sensual material of the earth, their bodies, and their tools. Three, although the identity of the slave, no less than that of the master, is sustained by conventional social recognition, the master's problem is that he demands recognition for an abstraction, absolute power, that defies concrete mediation. For Hegel, Rousseau, and Shelley alike, free agency is not about any supposed causal willpower, but about giving creative expression to a dream of freedom. By way of the particular material conditions to which we're chained, and they keep that dream at bay. A dream that sparks emancipatory work precisely because we can't pretend to own or master it. As Rousseau also emphasized, it's this question of ownership that finally most distinguishes slave and master. Whereas the master is tyrannized by his impossible claim to his own identity, the slave's identity is always external to him. The result of his work, which is to say the unpredictable interplay between his intentions and the infinite contingencies of the conditions under, work is work, under which his work is carried out. The slave's identity, then, is no less a product of these contextual contingencies than it is of the slave himself. Who the slave is, is as much given to him um, as uh, by the world, by the contingency of his work and the way uh, the, the result is socially recognized as it is produced by him. Consequently, for work is not organized only by the dream of personal liberation, but of uh, universal uh, liberation. In other words, the aim, is work, the aim of work is to overcome its limited identification with particular workers. Work is thus, in Shelley's sense, implicitly poetic, which is to say, prophetically attuned to utopian hope, because the final aim of work is just the liber liberation of work itself. The elimination of antagonism, not just between slave and master, but between work and its material and social conditions in general. That is, the dream of a work without ownership, the expression of the collective agency of the world as a whole. In Shelley's sense, this is what it would mean for poetry and history alike to be liberated from narratively reified purposes and identities, for the mere perpetual imaging of life and its eternal truth to suffice. Until then, as the iconic conclusion of Prometheus Unbound has it, slave labor entails a paradoxically sacrificial discipline of hope, to suffer woes which hope thinks infinite, to forgive wrongs dark, darker than death or night, to defy power which seems omnipotent, to love and bear, to hope till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. So in what sense can the phenomenology itself be seen to undertake slave labor? to create from its own wreck the thing it contemplates, instead of masterfully narrating the coming of age of some reified purpose or identity of history. One level of Hegel's commitment to tearing with the negative stands in clear contrast to Smith. Hegel recognizes that terror, radically indiscriminate negation, both in the case of the French Revolution uh, in, and in modernity generally, is not a contingent consequence, but part and parcel of liberal progressivism. In his account of the French Revolution, Hegel treats terror not as an ar arbitrary object of knowledge, but as an irreducibly concrete, traumatic, practical experience, symptomatized aesthetically by metaphors that liken bloodletting to drinking water and beheading to cutting cabbages. Negation of Cartesian sovereignty <coughs> is a concretely felt condition of properly grasping such metaphors, not an edifyingly removed spectacle. Yet the trauma here is evidently of an odd sort. 
not what we usually think of in Freud's terms as a kind of cracking open of the psyche's protective crust, but is already bound up in its compensatory symptom. That is, Hegel evokes the trauma of terror not as something that just breaks in upon a merely passive, receptive subject. Instead, Hegel's metaphors evoke the subject's quasi-expressive means of reacting to the shock. Thus, the metaphors of drinking water and cutting cabbage are like those of Blake's poem, The Fly, which depicts the neurosis of Cartesian dualism taking it to its traumatic, logical extreme, which, by reducing life to thought, leaves me, on the one hand, to see my own body as a totally out-of-control machine of terror, but, on the other hand, gives me no cause or means to care about this, to be other than dumbly complacent. In Blake and Hegel alike, the condition of terror is evoked by the very disenchantment of the metaphors. The trauma of revolutionary terror in the phenomenology is thus twofold. It's felt by subjectivity and by language itself. In this respect, an illuminating contrast can be drawn between Hegel's account of the Lord and Bondsman and that of the French terror. The former is written in the mode of myth, and while the latter has the jarring, radical irony we associate with Blake's songs and the acerb and acerbic modernists like Beckett and Brecht, um, the master-slave dialectic has the enchantment of mythological timelessness. It is peopled by the kind of unvarying schematic identities that characterize what Levi Strauss termed a cold culture, a culture that, indifferent to the distinctions among individuals and generations that obsess hot cultures like Western modernity, instead endlessly rehearse certain mythological identities and scenarios. The phenomenology deploys this enchanted mythological mode in order to mimic or performatively exemplify the rudimentary model of experience it's describing. This casts crucially illuminating light on the disenchanted metaphors deployed in the account of the French terror. The contrast reveals the phenomenology itself as suffering a disenchantment of metaphor akin to the disenchantment of violence that these metaphors would describe. There is something subtly but profoundly chilling about this metaphorical disenchantment itself that I'd suggest offers a potentially adequate means for us now of positively registering terror. Hegel does not challenge us to register the violence involved in what the metaphors of drinking water and chopping cabbage, cabbage uh, describe. He's not challenging us to recognize the violence of terrorist bloodletting itself. On the contrary, his premise is that as modern individuals, we are by nature already inured to this violence. The true challenge posed by Hegel's metaphor, then, is for us to recognize how familiar they are, how well they register our own casual indifference to mass violence. In other words, if Shelley's ode seems provokingly illegible to us now, Hegel would provoke us with the very legibility of his metaphors. In a context in which terrors become all too banal, Hegel would bring uh, this banality to self-consciousness and make it, if not enchanted, then uncannily haunting. Thus, the phenomenology stages a kind of modernist drama in which language suffers the same damage it would describe. In this sense, the book deploys its enlightenment commitment to integrity, not in the analytical mode of Kant's formal exposition of the categories of any possible experience, but in the aesthetic mode of Hamlet's gambit to catch the conscience of the king. Hegel thereby arguably inaugurates the literary genre known as continental philosophy by positing an essentially aesthetic criterion of philosophical truth, a criterion that plays on the dual senses of the German verb stimmen, to be true in the sense of correct, and to be in tune 
in the sense of musically attuned. Nietzsche, who lost no love on Hegel, nonetheless arguably offered the most compelling definition of attunement by way of tearing with the negative, what Nietzsche called philosophizing with the hammer, meaning a hammer that both smashes, smashes positivistic idols, but that also displays the amazing finesse and intellectual conscience of an ultra-sensitive tuning fork. So Hegel might be said to musicalize Kant, animating Kant's so-called static and empty formalism with the rhythm of history. <clears throat> no one has done more to elaborate the uncanny haunting of modern disenchantment than Walter Benjamin. In his essay on surrealism, Benjamin discusses this in terms of kitsch, which he likens to obsolete currency. To look at a banknote denominated in a defunct standard of exchange is to encounter the negative image of the commodity, the material remainder left by a disenchanted fetish. This residue doesn't represent some underlying true essence that the fetish disguised, but is instead a kind of sheer materiality that we can't grasp otherwise than as the absence of the fetish. The aura of kitsch for Benjamin is just this afterglow of a dispelled fetish, the way the excess materiality of the thing keeps reminding us of the fetish that isn't there. Kitsch aura attaches to the waste of the same commodity culture that dispelled older mythological and ritualistic forms of enchantment. Kitsch aura is how we tarry with the negative after modern consumerism reduces enchantment to price. In his writings on the flaneur, uh, the Arcade Project and the Paris of the Second Empire in Baudelaire, Benjamin describes the flaneur more generally the poetics of the crowd in terms of a two-staged historical development. While the first stage is characterized by a successful aestheticizing of the crowd that contains this violence, Smith-like, as a kind of spectacle, <coughs> the second stage is characterized by the failure of such aesthetic defenses. Yet a failure that Baudelaire's poetry nonetheless manages, Hamlet-like, to capture as a new kind of what uh, Benjamin calls experience for which the shock experience has become the norm. Uh, the first stage Benjamin associates with the detective story and above all with Poe. Quote, here the masses appear as the asylum that shields an asocial person from his persecutors. Of all the menacing aspect of the masses, this one became apparent first. It is at the origin of the detective story. In times of terror, when everyone is something of a conspiracy, conspirator, everybody will be in a situation where he has to play detective. Strolling gives him the best prospects of doing so. No matter what trail the flaneur may follow, every one of them will lead him to a crime. This is an indication of how the detective story, regardless of its sober calculations, also participates in fashioning the phantasmagoria of Parisian life. The detective contains the unruly crowd and the sublime aesthetics of crime itself. Posed man of the crowd, Benjamin writes, quote, purposely blurs the difference between the asocial person and the flaneur. The harder a man is to find, the more suspicious he becomes. Refraining from a prolonged pursuit, the narrator quietly sums up his insight as follows. This old man is the type and genius of deep crime. He refuses to be alone. He is a man of the crowd. Poe's story, according to Benny Mini, offers an x-ray of the detective story per se. But contrary to the commonplace association of such stories with the cathartic gratification of disclosure and explanation, Benny Mini emphasizes Poe's insistence on the crowd's demonic elusiveness. 
that as the story's concluding line has it, the man of the crowd remains irreducibly opaque and, quote, cannot be read. This very unreadability offers a gothic, sublime kind of aesthetic containment. This function is made particularly evident by the narrator's attribution of this unreadability itself to a mercy of God. The narrator's characterization of the man's mercifully unreadable criminality functions to release or redeem the narrator from the attempt to read it. In other words, Poe's emphasis on the merciful unreadability of the modern crowd's type of deep crime allows the narrator, and in turn the reader, precisely to continue to read it as unreadable. The mercy here, as in Smith, is precisely to absolve us of implication and violence, to relegate it to a removed spectacle. Baudelaire's prose poem, Les Foules, offers an instructive contrast insofar as it emphasizes, quote, the divine prostitution of the soul entailed by the unrelenting attempt to read the crowd. Here we come to what Benjamin characterizes as the second stage in the development of crowd poetics, where the experience of the flaneur becomes one with that of commodification. Quote, the crowd is not only the newest asylum of outlaws, it is also the latest narcotic for those abandoned. The flaneur is someone abandoned in the crowd. In this, he shares the situation of the commodity. He is not aware of this special situation, but this does not diminish its effect on him, and it permeates him blissfully, like a narcotic that can compensate him for many humiliations. The intoxication to which the flaneur surrenders is the intoxication of the commodity around which surges the stream of customers. In Baudelaire, trauma of the crowd is not contained as a sublime spectacle, reassuring and flattering the spectator, but explodes upon the spectator himself, who becomes implicated in the damage. Baudelaire's flunder's intoxication is the crowd's own proper poesie, Benjamin says. Quote, the pleasure of being in a crowd is a mysterious expression of the enjoyment of the multiplication of numbers. Recalling Shelley's insistence that poetry per se is poetry of destruction, Benjamin writes that the crucial condition of Baudelaire's mobilization of, a po of a crowd poetics lay in the fact that, it, at, that as it intoxicated him, it did not blind him to the horrible social reality. He remained conscious of it, though only in the way in which intoxicated people are still aware, aware of reality. That is to say, in Baudelaire, the big city never finds expression in the direct presentation of its inhabitants. The directness and harshness with which Shelley captured London through the depiction of its people could not benefit Baudelaire's Paris. For the flaneur, there's a veil of this picture. This veil is the mass. It billows in the twisting folds of the old metropolises. Because of it, horrors have an enchanting effect upon him. Benjamin's reading of Baudelaire's To a Woman Passing By further elucidates this implication of poetry in violence. To a Woman Passing By the deafening road around me roared, tall, slim, in deep mourning, making majestic grief a woman passed, lifting and swinging with a pompous gesture the ornamental hem of her garment, swift and noble with statuesque limb. As for me, I drank, twitching like an old rag, from her eye, livid sky, where the hurricane is born, the softness that fascinates, and the pleasure that kills. A gleam, then night. O oh, fleeting beauty, your glance, has, your glance has given me sudden rebirth. Shall I see you again, only in eternity? Somewhere else, very far from here, too late, perhaps never, for I don't, know, I don't know where you flee, 
nor you where I am going. O oh, you whom I would have loved, O oh, you who knew it. Here, the crowd is not supposed to conceal the very type of genius of crime and mercilessly render it unreadable. On the contrary, the poet's provocation to both the woman he addresses in the poem and the reader for whom she's the surrogate is to make legible the object of crowd desire. Uh, Benjamin writes, far from eluding the erotic in the crowd, the apparition which fascinates him is brought to him by this very crowd. The delight of the city dweller is not so much love at first sight as love at last sight. The never marks the high point of the encounter, when the poet's passion seems to be frustrated, but in reality bursts out of him like a flame. He burns in this flame, but no phoenix arises from it. What makes his body twitch spasmodically is not the excitement of a man in whom an image has taken possession of every fiber of his being. It partakes more of the shock with which an imperious desire suddenly overcomes a lonely man. Benjamin adds that this desire is one, quote, which only a city dweller experiences, which Baudelaire captured for poetry, and of which one might not infrequently say that it was spared rather than denied fulfillment. In contrast to Poe, the aesthetic Baudelaire evokes is not a mercy, but a threat, not a consoling, exoticizing of the crowd's unreadability, but a provoking insistence that its readability is undeniable. The reader, like the passerby herself, is challenged to acknowledge that we know what the poem is saying, that we're implicated in an implicitly violent fantasy, that the structure of our desire is not what we bourgeois would like to suppose, but is instead akin to that revealed by Hegel's metaphors of bloodletting and head chopping. Baudelaire allows the reader to experience only the shock of an emphatically fugitive vision of his desire, a vision of gratification and redemption so otherworldly that one is finally, quote, spared rather than denied fulfillment. One is left to burn in the flame in the sheer aesthetic of a desire bereft of any sublimating rising phoenix. Uh, uh, rendering it a comfortably distant spe spectacle. Thus, as Benjamin puts it in a letter to Adorno, it is the shock of astonishment itself that constitutes the very object of insight prepared by the poem. What's astonishing is just that, is that just such a crazy, fugitive vision could have a language, that we could read it and know it. This astonishment seems to represent a new, radically attenuated, but nonetheless viable form of en enchantment. Not the sublimely tragic enchantment of either Shelley's ode or po Poe's detective fiction, but the enchantment of a kind of spectral legibility, of suddenly realizing that, we're, that we speak the language of ghosts. And coming in the form of self-conscious knowledge, this is not the enchantment of sacrifice, but the enchantment of knowing ourselves to be already living among and conversant with impossible fantasies. It's a very paradoxical kind of enchantment that stems from acknowledging, <clears throat> acknowledging a language in which one is already conversant. But if it is the language of terror become banal, of Hegel's cabbage chopping and Blake's thoughtless hand, the promise of such astonishment is to direct our focus away from narrative desires of, with, of which we, whether we know it or not, would rather be spared than denied fulfillment, and towards poetic elaboration of veils of the mass, the multiplication of numbers. So I could uh, take another five minutes to um, talk a little bit about uh, Noir, film noir. Um, Works for me. Works for you guys. Okay. Um, another, perhaps more familiar way of construing 
menu means two stages of the fly noir. It's in terms of the noir revision of the classic detective story. In a way, noir aesthetics in fiction and film are too familiar even to warrant discussion. My intent in mentioning it is not to present you with new material, but like Hegel and Benjamin, to encourage you to recognize uh, that it is legible in a way that you might not have appreciated. That its structure of experience is not mercifully illegible like Poe's exotic spectacle, but like Baudelaire's poem, challenges us to acknowledge that we know it too. Like Benjamin Baudelaire's poet, the noir hero's experience is one of being an intoxicated symptom of his own impossibility. And so in Double Indemnity, uh, Barbara Stanwyck falls in love with Fred McMurray only after shooting him. Uh, the romance of Bonnie and Clyde is predicated on impotence and culminates in the orgasmic dance of their bodies observing machine gun fire. Chinatown's wonderfully lyrical love scene, prompted by Jack Nicholson's peering scrutiny of what Faye Dunaway stutteringly explains is a flaw in her iris, is retrospectively haunted by the film's final scene in which we're left peering into that same eye, opened into the gaping bullet wound. These are all rehearsals of the same impossible fantasy, the symptom of a world in which the shock experience has become the norm, and hence love has become unbelievable, otherwise than as dreams of which were spared rather than denied fulfillment. What is most remarkable about, about the noir genre is that it learned to exploit the form itself of such rehearsal. That is, it mobilizes its own generic status as a metaphor for the fatalistic, fatalistic sacrifices its characters perform. That is, part of what noir heroes resign themselves to is precisely the knowledge that they are noir heroes. Like Baudelaire's figure of the statuesque woman in mourning attire, noir relies on the figure of the outsized darkness of the femme fatale. But this is not Poe's sublime spectacle. The figure is less important as an actual sex, sex object than as what Benjamin terms a veil of the mass, the figure for the form itself of multiplying numbers. The signature of the noir world, the essence of noir fatalism, is the way in which proprietary individualistic romance gives way to an impersonal, generic one. In the iconic love scenes of Out of the Past and the Maltese Falcon, the men explicitly announce that they know they're falling in love with an illusion. They are not seduced by femme fatale, but rather use the women they're with as props for acting out quasi-masturbatory fantasies of such seduction. The noir hero thus is defined like someone whose erotic fantasies uh, uh, have been warped by watching too many film noir. <laughs> the pervasive homosocial relationships in noir narratives are another dimension in which individualistic romance serves as a veil of mass. Double Indemnity ends with McMurray telling his boss, Edward G. Robinson, I love you too, as the latter lights McMurray's cigarette for the first time returning the affectionate gesture McMurray had lavished on him throughout the film. Indeed, the whole film amounts to a kind of love letter from McMurray to Robinson, an overture the latter, the latter seems to reciprocate precisely in Baudelaire's terms. Robinson telling McMurray, I'm closer to you than you know. The latter isn't a sentimental spectacle, but a fate in which Robinson knows himself implicated. Our fantasies are the same, Robinson seems to say. Only I and not you have been spared fulfillment. The trope of mistaken identity is a noir staple. And indeed, noir fatalism is essentially resignation to the arbitrary exchangeability of individual identity, a way of casting oneself as a veil of mass, 
of mobilizing the form of multiplying numbers. To say that noir always rehearses the same story is, in a sense, just to say that it uh, is just what it means to say it's a genre. But I've tried to suggest how noir uses self-consciousness about its own generic status, a fadedness always to reenact the same noir story, to mobilize something like a poetics of the mass, a poetics that, like a flawed iris, projects damaged visions um, in order to elicit a social consciousness of the legibility of such visions. Shelley cast poetry as inherently prophetic, but since poetry builds on the wreckage of narratives, its prophecies appear in the noir form of, as he says, shadows cast by futurity upon the present. So, of what is the legibility of noir fantasy prophetic? Perhaps of what it might entail for the unsustainably hot culture of moder modern consumerism, insatiably pursuing ever less tenable forms of individual distinction, to finally return to a cold mythological culture. Thus, proprietary narrative pursuit of enchantment might give way to non-proprietary, poetic rehearsal of myth. As a final example, um, I'll just mention the multiplying number that may, may seem closest to home, which is 99%. Gandhi adopted as a kind of motto the remarkably disenchanted refrain of Shelley's Mask of Anarchy, ye are many, they are few. If Occupy represents an advancement on the methods of nonviolent resistance deployed by Gandhi and Dr. King, it might be in virtue of mobilizing more resolutely and emphatically just what I've tried to describe here. A poetics of the anonymous crowd, the collective not as a sentimental spectacle, but a poetic agency, an agency beholden to no narrative agenda, but just to wantonly evoking the astonishing legibility of its numbers, or, in Shelley's words, imaging life. Thank you.
really define the romance of uh, the noir heroes. Um, the, I often think about it in terms of the sound garden lyric, I need to know that this is my fate. This, it's, and what strikes me as really key is, and I think what, um, you know, Benny needs to also, and Baudelaire really keyed into, is this, the romance of this knowledge that I'm, I'm going down, and that there's something romantic about knowing that. Um, uh, so that, that, that's the self-consciousness that I have in mind. It's, a, they're, it's like they're playing the, a role in their own story that they've built up in their head. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, so that's, um, I, that's, you know, also what I'm saying, um, or what Benjamin is saying, Baudelaire is mobilizing his poem, this kind of crowd fantasy, and um, it, it, it's uh, completely, uh, you know, suicidal. It's, um, and, uh, but but the, the point is that, um, by, that by generating the poetics of this suicidal fantasy, um, uh, Baudelaire is opening up a new mode of like social recognition. We can recognize one another, maybe a new kind of eroticism too. We can recognize one another as participating in this fantasy. Um, but, it's, but it's just suspended as a fantasy. It's not the point of the fantasy is to become realized. But we can recognize our common sort of implication in this uh, um, morbid um, division. Well, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, and that's what I, I, I mean, that's actually, it's a, a, a problematic kind of um, uh, point to touch on, but that's what I wanted to suggest in um, the picture of the um, uh, femme fatale is um, uh, that it's, um, uh, uh, a function of, of the crowd. It's a, it's a generic um, uh, sort of impersonal fantasy that uh, the crowd projects. It's gendered, but the, um, I mean, I, I think the key thing to think about it is not in terms of the like gender politics of the fantasy itself. I mean, the fantasy is completely insane. Like, that that seem, it seems to me that's kind of secondary. It's a suicidal, completely violent fantasy. I mean, what Baudelaire's poem describes is either going psychotic when it, when he the, what it would mean to fulfill the fantasy is either psychosis or rape. Um, so um, uh, the the um, uh, kind of uh, the the point of the fantasy isn't acting it out, but just that it represents a kind of new plane of mutual recognition. Um, that that's that's the way I'm thinking about it. But it's obviously a very fraught, difficult question. I think. I just want to ask a question about your last point about uh, Occupy and uh, social movements, and then you mentioned this like consciousness of knowing that you're going down, and I'm wondering if that is um, the con like the consciousness of protesters at like Occupy movement. No, but I mean, in contrast to like Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King, right? right? Like, like I, maybe, maybe that to me that maybe the difference between the movements is that. In the case of Occupy or something, there is there is this kind of um, sense of like you know that you're going down or something. 
Yeah, but it, it, I really, I, it's a really complex thing to um, sort of piece apart. But what I'm, the, the distinction I'm trying to draw in my paper is between what I, I think Shelley in the Romantic mode was, he was really talking about a kind of enchanted, almost religious, like tragic sacrifice. Like we're, we're going to throw our bodies on the barricades and there's something beautiful about that. Um, but what I'm talking about in Baudelaire and Film Noir and in Occupy, it's, it's a different, it has a different aesthetic logic. It's not that of religion or religious or sacred sacrifice. It's a, a logic of, um, of fantasy, of spectacle. And so the knowledge that I talked about, the fatalistic knowledge, that's, that's a spectacle. It's something we see on the screen. And, or that we imagine as we read the poem. And we can participate in it or, or find a kind of social mutual recognition by, by saying, yeah, that's a picture of my mind. I can see my fantasy life in that image of wanting to go down. But, but the point isn't to do that. The point is just it gives us a picture of ourselves as a collective, our, 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 our collective erotic life, the way it's um, shaped, um, and um, so that's, that's what I um, want to say about um, Occupy is, is the uh, way in which a kind of aesthetic of the collective is, um, is asserted. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it, it, the other part of it is that you know, that sacred sacrifice that um, Shelley drawing on the Christian model is relying on, that's a, there's a kind of narrative to that, a narrative of sacrifice and redemption. But what I, what's intriguing to me about Occupy is just the sheer poetics of the just, the, you know, Benjamin calls the multiplying numbers, just, just bearing witness to the number, or just asserting, practicing, being a collective. Um, there's no narrative about sacri individual sacrifice and redemption. It's just being a collective um, and seeing what happens. That there's something kind of transformative and just sort of mobilizing um, and feeling and asserting that new form of agency that's no longer the individual form, that's something that in a sense of a kind of collective uh, mind and body. Is that anarchistic? Sorry. Go ahead, Terry. Is, 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 is that anarchistic for you? And, and like what, how you talk about anarchism, of course, Shelley takes the term, right? Um, and I think that people in this sort of, this, in, in this collective moment might also. Um, yeah, I wasn't entirely clear when you take that up, how much that's something that you kind of, you know, are you an anarchist, that kind of thing? <laughs> um, or is there kind of like a newer anarchism in this old kind of sacrificial Shalian, you know, um, mode? How does, how does that fit in? Is, is that sort of collective something that you think is anarchist? And if you do, then how does that compare with Shelley's version? Um, no, I don't think of it as, as anarchist. Um, Shelley's um, you know, patron was William Godwin, who um, was sort of the founding father of anarchist thinking. And, um, but his way of thinking of it was very kind of enlightenment, scientific, um, uh, that really kind of conceived of people as kind of atomic units. Um, and uh, um, so, Shelley's point about um, poetry is it really, sh it changes, it gives us sort of the form of um, our experience. And he you know, says at the uh, conclusion of the defense of poetry that the, the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Like they, they're legislating, they're giving a kind of um, uh, mandatory form uh, to uh, or lens through which we organize our experience in the world. So um, I don't know. There's something I think 
to passive or um, uh, uh, just from I think Shelley's point of view, unpoetic about um, anarchy. That it, what, what, what he's really interested in is a um, poetic agency. This um, assertion of uh, a, a, of a form that uh, organizes experience uh, in a particular way. Um, it, so, um, yeah. I mean, I can tell that's different. Then, but then, if you go, I mean, like, is it, is it, is it I mean, anarcho communism or something like what does it exist today and how does it compare? I'm interested in how, you know, different anarchy standards that they today that in conjunction with Occupy, for instance, you know, great work or something like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that a useful term at all? Is that, is that, or is, is that something that you know, really, um, so I, I know you, I don't know, you're interested in anarchism, right? And not just the shelly kind of autonomous individualist anarchism. Um, well, um, yeah, and I mean, it, it, Shelley's orientation is so much on the political, the poetic as opposed to the political, and uh, so uh, I, um, I, I just I think that that kind of um, I don't know strategic or I don't know if that's the right word, but. Um, uh, really interested in something that to my mind seems kind of more revolutionary like he wants to um, change the sort of parameters of um, you know existential experience like um, and it, it, he doesn't want to just like rearrange the political organization of people he wants to transform them and turn you know to wants to transform the world and turn it into something different than what it is. Um, so in my thinking, um, that it's uh, the kind of legislation that he thinks poetry is doing is um, more, more radical somehow. Um, you know, that said, I think, you know, anarchy is, uh, you know, has a kind of heuristic um, value in, in, time, in, in terms of just throwing in question or kind of organizing political narratives of, you know, bourgeois liberalism or, or, or whatnot. Um, but again, it, it seems to me that Shelley it wants to go further than that, when he really wants to take it into this visionary um, kind of experience of poetry. Yeah, uh, have you read the, any of uh, Joan Kopchak's uh, work on film noir, the hard-boiled detective story, mm -hmm. uh, Shades of Noir? Mm -hmm. and, uh, she uh, articulates a lot of the same uh, coordinates yeah. of uh, the noir universe that you do. Um, the A, subjective monstrosity, you know, the femme fatale, uh, the radical submersion of the noir detective, and so on. Not by way of over there at all. So I find that's a really interesting intervention. Mm -hmm. She never really refers to him. Uh, she does, of course, refer to Poe. Um, but um, she supplements all of that um, with, um, by way of, of double indemnity, um, the emergence of biopolitical reality, um, the avalanche of numbers that makes um, that narrative universe possible. Mm -hmm. they're, they're scamming an insurance company, uh -huh. right? And uh, I'm just wondering if that, because you know, that's, um, that's not the agentive uh, generation of new parameters of subjectivity. That is the, the avalanche of something totally unagentive. It's almost environmental that perturbs the possibilities of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondering if you, if you have it. I don't know, that's, but it seems to me that she see, also sees a kind of, um, you know, something kind of liberating. That again, is that it's about what's. I mean, to me, what's so compelling about this stuff is it just sort of turns the table on you know what I was talking about is the kind of traditional buildings from our coming of age way of thinking about liberal um, emancipation or liberal subjectivity, um, which we think of as oh, we have all this rich potential. We need to like disencumber all the ourselves of all the kind of fake 
um, constraints or obstructions imposed on us by the world. Um, and let all that richness out, that you know, realize the potential and stuff. And what's fascinating to me about um, the way Hegel and um, uh, Benjamin and the rest frame it is uh, just the opposite. Let's say what liberates us is thinning out, getting out of ourselves, as, as uh, supposedly. Uh, uh, rich individuals full of potential and um, seeing it as thinning out into uh, a larger kind of collective uh, point of view. And um, so I find thinking in terms of anonymity or numbers, they also like in the sense of Occupy, um, there's something exciting uh, about that. Um, and, yeah, I think that's that's a big part of like, it, and it's weird to think that there that there can be a kind of romance to that too. Like, I think that's part of the, what the film does at the at the end with um, uh, um, uh, Edward Robinson uh, um, sort of acknowledging that he, his um, sense of connection with um, Frederick Murray. Uh, that he's, he's sort of saying, um, I, you know, I include you in my actuarial tables, like that, because he's sort of the master of the, uh, he's the master actuary. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I kind of see, we see that in the piece. I was just trying to draw some, uh, not knowing what you exactly were going to talk about tonight, but having readings to go by, trying to find parallels between the, the readings. And it seemed to me that both Hegel and um, Baudelaire had an intense social anxiety. Um, <laughs> at Hegel, is, he has this dialectic where they're going to fight to the death when you know, uh -huh. And then you've got Baudelaire where you're terrified of the crowd. You don't want to jostle the crowd. And so it's like, Two guys who yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but I I mean I think that's a cool um, comparison. But what strikes me too is remember the other side of the um, what Benjamin is saying is that uh, you, you're intoxicated. It's horrifying, but it's a kind of an intoxicating horror, which to me is also kind of like reminiscent of a cinema experience. The way in which it can, it can be sort of you can be miserable and enjoying it, or you know horrified and enjoying it at the same time. Um, but I, I, what I really love about Hegel is the way he is able to evoke this kind of perspective of the um, of the culture as a whole. The way he's really able to t tell a story from the perspective of uh, uh, a whole. Um, mode of social organization and uh, knowledge and, uh, and so on. So, um, uh, I mean, I don't know about him personally, how much social anxiety he had, but I feel, I feel like there's just such a thrill in like working through the, the master-slave dialectic. And see, and to, I mean, it's just this intense, um, you know, uh, social psychology that he's, this drama of like two people looking at each other and sort of psyching each other out in all these complex ways. So I think he, he loves to kind of think in this social um, uh, spirit. Shall we adjourn to the bar? Uh, thanks so much.